Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be speaking today about community and entrepreneurship and the way they support innovation. So I believe that innovation is our generation's answer to solving the world's problems. And I hope I'll convince you of that through the course of this talk. I'm going to start by asking you each to think of an innovation in the last 10 years that you think changed the world. Just think about it yourself. Come up with one. Okay. So the way I think about it, we, we've all know the old adage that you can teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime, but if you give a man a fish, he'll only eat for a day. Of course, it works for women, I think, as well. <laughs> I think of innovation as a way to, to invent a better fishing rod. And it really is a very different thing than those other things we just talked about. It's a different order of magnitude because it, you know, when I was younger, I, I worked in refugee camps with kids. I worked in incubators in South Africa that were struggling. And I was able to help a room full of people. If you're an innovator, you can help a billion people with your work. And that's what's really special about it. I want to sort of get across why this is special and then talk about how community and entrepreneurship are means to get more of this good thing. So a couple of examples that I came up with of world-changing innovation. We all know that the world's running out of oil, right? And yet we run on oil. So Presumably, this is going to be a bit of a problem when the, the two come together. In the last 10 years, innovators got together and they figured out how to invent a car using hybrid technology that uses half the fuel of the cars that came before it. How many of you here have driven a hybrid car? You know, or no one have a friend? Yeah, so a lot of us, right? So this is just in the last 10 years. We heard, uh, we all know about genetic mapping. We know a lot about this, ne this now. You know, we're reverse engineering our bodies. We're attacking diseases in entirely new ways. Uh, that was first published in April of 2003, just about exactly 10 years ago, right? Changing the world. So we all know about smartphones. They're about six, year, six years old, and the video capabilities and the connectivity that they have, they turn them into kind of little, little Star Trek communicators, right, that we all carry now. This is making it such that no matter where you are in the world, a government or an individual who does something wrong in public is likely to be to be caught. This is bringing transparency to our world. This particular picture is from Tahrir Square. The previous government of Egypt did what governments for millennia have been doing, which is when people didn't like them, they cracked down. But this time it was different as a result of this innovation. And that government is out of power. And last week, we saw a couple weeks ago, we saw something similar in Boston. Some people thought that they could commit a terrible crime in Boston, get away with it, and they learned that that's no longer possible with the technologies that we have today. These are just a few examples of how innovation is changing things. So if you're still wondering, OK, yeah, you know, people say that, but is this, really, is this really playing out? This is a little bit of research done at the University of Washington by Professor Phil Howard. Uh, on the horizontal axis here, it shows the change in democracy of nations. They calculate this very carefully, looking at things like rule of law and freedom of the press and so forth. And the dots on the right-hand side are countries that are becoming more democratic. On the vertical axis, you have the increase in the spread of the internet. Uh, now, this may or may not be causal. We don't know that. But what we're seeing is, as these technologies are spreading, the world is getting to be a better place. So it's very exciting to think about innovation and what, can it, do, what it can do for us. Just briefly, you know, is innovation the same as in invention and discovery? It's, it's not exactly the same thing. Innovation is taking invention and discovery and other good ideas and, and putting it to use in the real world. If it's not practically applied, if it's not being used, we don't really think of it as innovation, right? So uh, you all raised your hand or a bunch of you uh, about whether you used a, a hybrid car. Um, how many of you uh, have a smartphone or have used one? OK. How many of you have DNA? Just, just checking. Seriously. I think that, uh, that this really is our generation's answer to making the world better, and it's something we can get a lot more of, OK? A generation ago, we did innovation a little bit differently, right? Innovators were frequently very lonely individuals. They, worked, they often worked from home. They would go to the garage behind the house. Uh, they would, uh, they would kind of work away in silence. There was a high failure rate. It's very hard for them to get the help that they needed. Uh, this particular image shows the garage where Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard famously founded Hewlett Packard. Some people are nodding. They've seen that. Uh, this is the garage where uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started Apple. And this is the garage where Walt Disney started Walt Disney Studios. This was the way it was done, but it was a long, slow, risky, and pretty lonely process. So this is the face of innovation today. 
what's, what's, what's happening today is that people are getting together. They're clustering into, into a, a single place, a dense, intense cluster of innovators and entrepreneurs. And they're doing it differently than we've ever done it before. The, the chief difference is that they're helping each other. I believe that what's happening is that we're combining three key ingredients. One ingredient is the startup founder. I'll talk a little bit about that. Special kind of individual. The second ingredient is proximity. And we'll, I'm going to share with you some research about the impact of proximity, people being next to each other. And the third is this culture of helping. That's a choice we make as communities. And I see a lot of it right here. It's very exciting. So the startup founder, this, this is an incredible person, almost a magical person. They're a success-bound individual who sort of walk through walls, right? I've worked with 1,500 startup, in, startup founders now over the last decade at Cambridge Innovation Center. And when you meet these people, you just want to cheer for them. They begin the day alone and with relatively few resources. They typically don't have any money. They typically don't have a team around them. And usually the idea that a startup founder has initially is a start, but it, it's not quite there yet. But they are skilled at communicating with others. They're skilled at storytelling. They're skilled at listening to others and, and incorporating their ideas. They're skilled at asking for financial support and winning people to their banner. So I think about it as those high school images of like microorganisms with all their little feelers going out in every direction. This is the way I think of startup founders. They are, they are reaching out in every direction. They're looking for help, and they usually get it. So the second ingredient is this notion of proximity. You know, we're just beginning to appreciate the power of proximity and how it impacts startup founders and the innovation process. Uh, we know intuitively that being close to others is important. Our neighbors help us, interacting helps. But let's look at what, it really, what the data really says about that. So this is, th what this shows is that in Bell Laboratories, where they did this analysis, being on the same corridor with somebody, this is being very close to them, led to a fairly high level of collaboration. About 10% of people ended up collaborating with each other. Just being on a different corridor dropped that by a factor of about five. Being on the different floor in the same building dropped it by a factor of 20. So it's, a, it's, a, it's worth 20 times more collaboration to be close to somebody uh, than it is to be just a little bit farther away from them. And we should remember this as we think about supporting our innovators and our entrepreneurs. So the last element that I think is really key here is a choice we make. It's not something that just happens from the outside. We have to, we have to lead our way to this. And this is developing a culture of helping and collaboration. The, you know, in the, we sometimes call this startup culture, and you do see it in, in places like Cambridge Innovation Center. I'm seeing it right here in Grand Rapids. You know, there's this feeling that if somebody comes to you and presents a problem to you, you just want to help them. You want to, you want to go out of your way. If you know an investor who might be interested in their startup, if you know a potential customer, you're going to put some real time into helping them. And we sometimes say to ourselves, we're not quite sure why we're doing this. It's not necessarily in our personal interest to spend all day helping this other person. But we know it's the right thing to do. That's startup culture. And it's very, very powerful because it means that a whole village is building these, these new companies, not just the founder. So I liken it to the old small town image of a barn raising where somebody's building a barn and everybody comes out and everybody pitches in and in a day you've got a barn that one person just might not be able to build on their own. So what specifically do these innovation clusters provide? When, when, when people come together into one of these buildings, just so you can picture it, the center that, that I operate is most of an office tower next to MIT. It's got about 500 startups all, all sort of jam-packed together over about 10 floors. Uh, there, if you walk in, you know, there's this just sense of energy everywhere. It's this sort of vibrancy. People say this. You've really got to kind of visit one of these centers to really know what I'm talking about. But those of you who have, and I see people nodding, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's just this energy um, that really boosts you and helps you through those tough times. Um, the second thing is that you have practical needs. You have questions. You have challenges. And there's somebody in the room who has the answer to just about every challenge you have. And this means that problems, roadblocks, barriers that might have taken you days or weeks in the past to overcome as you're building your business fall away from you in hours or minutes. The last thing that these innovation clusters are doing, and I think it's a, um, it, we're still just watching it play out. We don't fully understand this phenomenon, uh, is that resources are aggregating around them in an unusual way. So when we founded CIC in Kendall Square, Cambridge, we had almost no venture capital around us. It was, a, it was a very quiet area. We had a research university, but otherwise there wasn't a lot going on. And then over the years, these, the venture capital investors started noticing this and started moving closer and into the building. And for this talk, I did a little research just asking myself, well, just how far has that gone? 
and we were kind of floored by the results. What we found is that if the two buildings that we're now in, in, in Kendall Square, were a U.S. state, our two buildings would rank as the fourth largest U.S. state in terms of venture capital under management. A little bit ahead of Connecticut and behind New York, Massachusetts, and California. So uh, this, this attraction of resources is not just venture capital, it's all of the resources that go, that go into building a startup. Once you start to build a beacon, a sort of a focus of the energy of entrepreneurship, these resources just naturally start to flow into that beacon. And that's really the power of community supporting entrepreneurship and the two of them creating innovation. So this is not just happening in places like Cambridge, this is happening all over the world. This map shows the locations of a, of a network of innovation clusters called the Hub. The Hub is a network which fo focuses on social entrepreneurship. And I believe they're now in, in 15 countries and 39 cities. Uh, this idea is going to the edges of the world. This is a picture from Lagos, Nigeria, where they've built a, a center, one of these centers. And I started hearing about it. We emailed them a few days ago and said, can, you know, can we use a picture of your center? And they got back within minutes and said, absolutely. The, the world is, this, this is just happening everywhere. So significant innovation, powerful innovation, we know that that comes from all over the world. And I'm going to give you a few examples just to underscore this point. You know, kind of famously, uh, the telephone comes from, uh, comes from the United States. It was uh, invented just down the street from us. Uh, the, uh, you know, these little images aren't the ones that they were on my Mac, so I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, pa paper uh, was, uh, was developed in China. Um, the steam engine uh, was developed, <laughs> can't you tell, uh, in, uh, in Scotland, uh, in England. Um, the, um, the pacemaker uh, was developed <laughs> in Australia. Um, the, um, the heart transplant was developed uh, in South Africa. Uh, that one's right. The ruler uh, came from India and... Um, uh, the ballpoint pen actually came from the lower left-hand corner from Argentina, for those of you who don't know that. Um, it's fascinating. And what that tells you is that innovation is just coming from everywhere. Uh, I'm, I wanted to close this little part of this on this picture. Does anyone recognize where this is, by the way? Any hands? So this is Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, I, I would challenge the high school students watching um, on the live stream to, to point this out on a map to us. Uh, I'm sure they could, where the rest of us probably can't. Uh, Tallinn, Estonia is where Skype came from, which is the world's leading uh, long-distance telephone service. So innovation really comes from everywhere, and that's just a very powerful thing to know because it means that this isn't the province of any one place. This doesn't, you know, we're not stuck because we're in, you know, in a place where we think we don't have all the resources. We really do. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a map of Grand Rapids. So, uh, as uh, most of you here would, would know, uh, Grand Rapids is home to the three of the top five companies in the office furniture category. Um, you know, every place, and there are a bunch of other companies that are headquartered here, but every place has its innovation leaders. So I think the real message is that, you know, we can, wherever we are in the world, we can use these notions of getting people together, of working together, of clustering our entrepreneurs to take the resources we do have and concentrate them. And we can start to change the world for the better using this notion of the better fishing rod. So uh, what can you do to get involved? If you are a uh, high school student or you're a college student, what I would recommend is to seek out the centers in your community that are like this. Show up. There are internship opportunities for high school students, college students. If you are a professional that has a little bit of extra time, show up and offer your time. Initially, you probably won't be remunerated particularly much because startups don't have a lot of money, but you'll learn a great deal and you'll have a huge potential to make the world a better place. So in closing, just again, I think that this is our generation's answer to making the world a better place and I look forward to your help doing it. Thank you very much. <laughs>